Hola, mi amigos and amigas. Ciao, mi amici. And happy October 1st. We did it. My birthday month, everybody. One of my favorites. Four weeks to 49 for me, baby. Thank you very much for joining me on today's episode of Stand Up. I have a really awesome, very smart author, activist, media commentary, and person in long-term recovery. Ryan Hampton joins me today to talk about his new book. He's written three now, three very important books on this issue. But this is called Fentanyl Nation, Toxic Politics and America's Failed War on Drugs. Ryan Hampton is a great guest. You're going to love my conversation with him. This is such an important, relevant issue to America's public health epidemic, as well as the election politics. 60 Minutes covered the issue this past Sunday night. They should have talked to Ryan Hampton. So good. You're going to love it. It starts at 19 minutes. But first, just want to remind you tonight, I will be hosting a watch party for the first and only vice presidential debate. It's J.D. Vance versus Tim Walls, 9 p.m. I will start the Zoom hangout at 8.30 p.m. tonight, and you will get an email with a link to join us if you are a paid subscriber. If you're not, man, you are missing out. We're growing, and we have a whole bunch of amazing, exciting, thoughtful, brilliant folks joining us all the time. We would love to have you. And also, I announced yesterday, and I'll say every day, the weekend of March 30th, Vegas, Pod Jam 2, Put it in your calendar. Save the date. It's coming together real quick. I've got Eric Siegel, Ophira Eisenberg, and John Carroll already committed to joining me. What other regular guests of mine would you like to come out to Vegas and join us? We're going to improve on everything we did last year. We're going to have a whole agenda and make it one big experience that will be much more inclusive and much more organized than what we had last year. And I'm going to have some of your favorite guests joining us. So mark it down. March 30th weekend, Vegas. And keep listening for all the details. We'll talk more about the ideas for what we'll do this Thursday night's hangout, but I hope to see you tonight at our vice presidential debate watch party. But now it's time for your news headlines and sound bites coming at you right now. Let's start with the WTF happened today daily newsletter. I love this. Matt Kaiser writes it and he writes WTF happened today all in one sentence. Here it is. Biden may ask Congress for a special session to pass supplemental disaster funding to address the broad and devastating impacts of Hurricane Helene. A Georgia judge struck down the state's abortion law that effectively banned abortions after about six weeks of pregnancy. President Biden expanded his, quote, temporary asylum restrictions at the U.S.-Mexico border, effectively making the strict immigration policy impossible to lift. Trump called for the police to be given one really violent day or hour to combat crime, like, you know, the purge. And the Justice Department sued Alabama for removing voters from its election rolls too close to the presidential election. The Republican National Committee is involved in more than 120 lawsuits across 26 states as part of a strategy to preemptively challenge potential law undercut the legitimacy of the election and lay the groundwork to challenge the results after the November 5th vote. That's why we got to win big. All right, let's dig into those headlines and more, starting with what's happening over in southern Lebanon. Israel conducted raids in the Lebanon. It's officially a ground war now in Lebanon, as it is in Gaza. Israeli commando units made brief incursions in the Lebanon recent days as signs emerged that Israel was preparing for a wider invasion targeting Hezbollah. Israel's defense minister said today, quote, the next stage of the war against Hezbollah will commence. The raids focused on gathering intelligence about Hezbollah's positions close to Israel's northern border, as well as identifying Hezbollah tunnels and military infrastructure, which officials Expect Israel to try to destroy if a broader operation follows. Today, troops were seen gathering at the border. Israel's cabinet also met yesterday night to discuss whether and when to launch a major ground operation in southern Lebanon, which would be Israel's first there in nearly two decades. American officials said they believe that the invasion would hopefully be a limited one. Well, we will see about that. I highly recommend you watch the open for debate debate between Journalist and commentator Mehdi Hassan and former Israeli government spokesman Elon Levy hosted, uh, moderated by John Donvan, who does probably one of the best jobs I've ever seen in very contentious debate. John does an amazing job. And so check that out at Open to Debate. And I will actually be participating in a debate October 8th at the Comedy Cellar against Fox News comedian Jimmy Fela, which is basically about Kamala Harris versus the disgraced former president. Really looking forward to that. I'm sure tickets are available. Go to opentodebate.org. 
All right, back to the headlines. The presidential election, 35 days away, and major news tonight. Some of the busiest U.S. ports are set to shut down. I'm seeing reporting as of 9 p.m. East Monday night. Port operators from New England to Texas are bracing for a strike by the powerful Longshoremen's Union that appeared likely to begin early Tuesday, a work stoppage that will bring trade to a halt along the coast and send ripples through the broader economy. So definitely not good for incumbents as well as obviously Democrats. Democrats at the national level five weeks before the national election. The White House said administration officials have been working in touch with both sides, working around the clock over the weekend to avert the strike. The shippers and operators represented by the United States Maritime Alliance issued a statement late Monday saying the sides had traded proposals in recent days and requesting a contract extension to allow for further negotiation. The alliance described its offer as generous, including 50 percent raises. The union did not immediately respond publicly as the clock ticked toward a midnight deadline. So check social media when you wake up and you'll know whether or not longshoremen are on strike. I hopefully there's some kind of last minute miracle. If a strike goes on long, many experts expect President Biden, who has the authority to order striking dock workers back to work to step in. But administration officials have said he's not planning to intervene and other unions have urged him not to. And now let's get to the aftermath of the horrific Hurricane Helene raging floods and mudslides unleashed by the remnants of Delta, an unprecedented tragedy in the mountains of western North Carolina. According to the state's governor, at least 37 people in the region have died. Hundreds remain unaccounted for and drone service are scarce. Supplies are arriving by plane and mule in North Carolina in this region. The death toll has topped 130, those 37 people just in the mountains of Western North Carolina. And though the hurricane made landfall in Florida, the damage to communities across the mountains of Southern Appalachia has been especially dire. Neighborhoods across the region have been destroyed and emergency workers spent yesterday racing to deliver much needed supplies. President Biden said he would visit the region maybe later this week. And it's become political right away with the disgraced former president saying that they are somehow not delivering supplies to MAGA areas where his supporters live. He just made it up. And of course, also saying that President Biden did not reach out to the Georgia governor. He did complete lie. I've got the sound for you coming up in the sound bites. And apparently a weekend fire that sent a massive plume of dark smoke into the Georgia sky has led to complaints about a strong chemical smell and hate several miles away across metro Atlanta where some schools canceled and residents living near the fire sheltered at home. All right, let's go to California where the state yesterday announced a ban on legacy admissions at private universities, which I think is an interesting move. I fully support. And now let's head to the UK, where the country's last coal-burning power plant, it shut down yesterday. The power station, the last coal-burning power station is done, making it the first among the world's major industrial economies to wean itself off of coal. Congratulations to the British. And now let's go to America's energy issue. In Michigan, the federal government has approved a $1.5 billion to restart a shuttered nuclear plant. So are we going backwards or is nuclear the way forward? What say you? In New York, lawyers for the mayor, Eric Adams, has asked a federal judge to throw out the bribery charges against him, providing an early glimpse at his defense. I don't think it's going to happen. In Russia, the Kremlin announced its intentions to increase its military spending by about 25 percent next year. A judge in Georgia's Fulton County struck down the state's six week abortion ban Monday, which was another huge story from yesterday, allowing the procedure to resume and making it legal up to 22 weeks of pregnancy. The state's law was signed by Republican Governor Brian Kemp in 2019, but didn't take effect until July 2022 after it faced a legal challenge and the Supreme Court's reversal of Roe v. Wade. And finally, two more very prominent Americans have passed away, both athletes, the great Dikembe Mutombo, the NBA star and humanitarian. He died at just 58 years old. And the legendary and controversial baseball player Pete Rose has died at the age of 83. And those are the headlines that I've got for you today. Now let's get to the sound bites that I got. First of all, yesterday, the disgraced former president remarked about the hurricane and said something pretty dumb, which was completely unsurprising. He said no one could have predicted hurricane at the peak of hurricane season. Well, he was visiting Georgia. He also falsely accused President Biden of sleeping through the disaster that has ravaged the southeast. He also said that 
Joe Biden had not reached out to the governor, Brian Kemp. Brian Kemp, a Republican who supports Trump, had a checkered pass with him, but that was immediately fact-checked. Anyway, here's how it went down yesterday. Just quickly, a brief clip of the disgraced former guy. You got to hear him. Throughout Georgia, as well as uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Virginia, Alabama, and Tennessee. That's our big one. And the devastation wrought by the storm is uh, incredible. It's uh, so extensive. Nobody thought this would be uh, happening, especially now it's so late in the season for the hurricanes. Late in the season for the hurricanes. Nobody could have predicted a hurricane at the peak of hurricane season. Hurricane season in the United States is considered to last from early June through late November. We're currently in the peak of it, even as states around the Gulf reel from the impact of Helene. The National Hurricane Center continues to track five additional storms near the East Coast. And now here is Trump saying that Biden did not call the Georgia governor. And in that clip, you hear the Georgia governor say, oh, yeah, the talk did a good talk. And then, well, here it is. Ideally, with the governor, that governor needs to uh, he's been trying to get them and uh, I'm sure they're going to come through. But uh, he's been calling the president, hasn't been able to get him. But uh, I just spoke. The president just called me uh, yesterday afternoon. I missed him and called him right back. And he just said, hey, what do you need? And I told him, you know, we we got what we need. We'll work through the federal process. He he offered that if there's other things we need, just to call him directly, which I appreciate that. All right. And then later on in the day, the president of the United States, Joe Biden, was asked about this by reporters. Mr. President, Mr. President and Governor Cooper, Donald Trump has, has accused both of you of ignoring uh, the He is lying. Let me get this straight. He's lying. And the governor told him he was lying. The governor told me he was lying. I've spoken to the governor, I've spent time with him, and he told me he's lying. I don't know why he does this. And the reason I get so angry about it, I don't care about what he says about me, but I care what he, what he communicates to the people in the, that are in need. It implies that we're not doing everything possible. We are. We are. And you, and you, you spoke to the governor. I assume you heard the Republican governor of Georgia talk about that he was on the phone with me more than once. So that's simply not true. And it's irresponsible. Not true and irresponsible, says the president. And the vice president also playing, performing her role as vice president in this horrible disaster yesterday. Over the past 24 hours, I have spoken with Governor Kemp of Georgia, Governor Cooper of North Carolina, and many local officials. I have shared with them that we will do everything in our power to help communities respond and recover. And I've shared with them that I plan to be on the ground as soon as possible, but as soon as possible without disrupting any emergency response operations, because that must be the highest priority in the first order of business. All right. There you go. Kamala Harris yesterday handling the responsibilities of vice president for this horrible disaster in North Carolina and beyond. Also, she was on this podcast. Former NBA star Matt Barnes hosts it. And I thought this is an interesting couple minutes. There, It's about a 45 minute interview taped last week. It's called All the Smoke. That's the name of the podcast. And thought this was pretty interesting, so I wanted to share it with you. Last question. As someone who's broke a ton of barriers throughout your journey and your journey is continuing to elevate, what does it mean to you to be the first woman president, but the first black woman as president? Well, not there yet. Knock wood. My mother had many sayings, and one of them is she would say to me, calmly, you may be the first to do many things. Make sure you're not the last. And I take that so very seriously. I've had the good fortune to mentor a lot of people along the way, including to this day. For me, it's about one, understanding the shoulders I stand on. We talk about a Shirley Chisholm and then so many people who are alive, who have mentored me and helped me up. And I just, I feel so strongly that, you know, each one pull one. You got to leave that door open Mm. more than it was when you walked in. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's what it means to me. It's a, it, I feel a great sense of responsibility. I mean, you talk about your daughter and what she's doing at school. I look at our sons. I look at, I mean, I feel a sense of responsibility to hopefully remind them that you should never hear no. 
You should never hear nobody like you has done this before or it's not your time or they're not ready. Like, don't hear that. Don't hear that. I eat no for breakfast. <laughs> That's my saying. Well, I, think too, I eat no for breakfast. You got to see it to believe it. We talked about you that do. growing up in the community. You, you got to see it to, to believe it. We can, we, we've can. we seen Obama do what he does, and now we have an opportunity to possibly see you. Yeah. And I, to me, you know, five, six daughters, and, you know, I have, I have a daughter just to be able to see it means so much. Right. Well, because there's so many, it's sadly, but there's so much good in the world. So let's start with that. And there's so many positive messages. Mm-hmm. And there are some that are not positive and that would suggest to our kids, to our young people that they're alone, that they don't have champions, that they um, don't belong, that they're not entitled to, that they don't have rights, including the right to be a leader. Right. And I hope that in my career and in my work, to the extent I am able to um, help people reject that, that I can do that. Kamala Harris doing her thing. I really like that. I really like her. I watched the Frontline episode about Harris versus Trump, where I learned even more about Kamala Harris, the roots of why she wanted to find justice for people who had been abused, because her friend growing up had been sexually abused. And when she found out, she invited her to move in with her family. I mean, it's a pretty amazing story. And she's a pretty amazing woman. That's for sure. We'd be very, I think, lucky to have her as Gail right now. All right. Well, I've got a great guest for you joining me now. He is a real, real smart guy. This is his third book that we're talking about, dealing with the issue of opiates and addiction and now fentanyl. He's the author of Unsettled and American Fix, and he's a national addiction recovery advocate, author, media commentator, and person himself in long-term recovery. He's worked with multiple nonprofits nationwide to end overdose and served in leadership capabilities and served in leadership capacities for various community organizing initiatives. Ryan Hampton is in recovery from a decade of active opioid use, a leading voice in America's rising recovery movement. And this book is so good. I, I learned so much. He debunks myths and false claims that have swirled around fentanyl. He lays plain the prejudice, discrimination, and stigma that's been codified into our drug laws while calling for a compassionate and evidence-based approach to address the core causes of addiction and save countless lives. He's also running for assembly in Nevada, and I'm going to invite him to our next hangout next week, I think. He'll join us, and hopefully we can help get him elected out there in Nevada. In 60 Minutes, did and I tackled this issue, and I just want to share a, a couple of clips from that show. First, the uh, a couple who lost their son to a fentanyl overdose that this segment opened with. I think he was just out having a good time and making made a stupid mistake. You know, the, the experimental days of taking drugs in college are over. All the pills are laced with fentanyl. It sounds like you've had a crash course in learning about fentanyl. Absolutely. At the rate that fentanyl is killing people in this country, it is absolutely ludicrous that this is not on the front page of every newspaper and every news broadcast daily. Absolutely heart-wrenching story for that family and way too many others. And now here's Bill Whitaker, the correspondent on 60 Minutes, introducing the segment. And then I'll bring you my conversation with Ryan Hampton. We are in the midst of the worst drug crisis in U.S. history. The drug is fentanyl. And unlike cocaine and heroin, it's a purely chemical man-made drug. It's cheap to produce, easily smuggled, and packs an incredibly addictive punch, 50 times more powerful than heroin. Nearly all the fentanyl flooding into the U.S. is made in Mexico by two powerful drug cartels with chemicals primarily purchased from China. And as you're about to hear, it is frequently hidden in counterfeit pills made to look just like prescription drugs. It's the scourge of our time. Last year, more than 70,000 Americans died from fentanyl. That's a higher death toll than U.S. military casualties in Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan combined. All right, there you go, the iconic 60 Minutes stopwatch. All right, let's get to my conversation with Ryan Hampton now. His new book, Fentanyl Nation, is out. Go get it. Let's do it. 
All right, I've just told you all about him, and Ryan joins me now. Congratulations on the new book. I'm very, very excited to talk to you. I, th- I think it's so important what you have done with your work and your life. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Pete. Appreciate it. So I just got to talk a little bit about your personal story. You yourself were on track to be a Washington policy guy, a policy guy. That's what you were interested in. You went on a hike. You you, you damaged your ankle badly. You got a prescription. And then 10 years of addiction, which is an insane amount of time in your life. Can you tell me about just your own experience as an addict, what happened to you in your life, which leads us to all of your work. I think it's fair to say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, like you said, I was on this trajectory to work in public policy. I had worked with Democrats, Republicans, folks from all different stripes of the political spectrum. And I did go hiking. I had actually worked in the white house from 1999 to 2001, went on a hike, injured myself, ended up uh, in the care of an urgent care physician, they gave me uh, Dilaudid, hydromorphone, very powerful opioid. Uh, I was supposed to get that knee and that ankle checked out, but I actually kept going back for another prescription, another prescription, and another prescription. And one of the, I think, important things that I always like to mention, and I glossed over a little bit in my first book, American Fix, that came out in 2018, but I've talked about it more openly since then, um, was I was dealing with like a lot of trauma in my life too. I, my father had just passed away. Um, I was questioning my sexual identity. I didn't know what my place was in this world. I am a survivor of, you know, childhood sexual abuse and things like that. And you, you, had me, dad, you, you had me at my father just passed away. I was like, yeah, that's a time that we all go to one drug or another. We shouldn't, but maybe, you know, some yeah. obviously that are prescribed, but then question your sexual identity, childhood trauma. I mean, yeah, that's mm-hmm. why does, why do you bring that up now? Why, you know, why didn't you talk about it in your first book? Because I think it's important for folks to know that it's okay to be a little bit more public with your struggles, right? I found that through, you know, wearing my struggles on my sleeve, being public about them has allowed me to let go a lot of, of a lot of that. It's been an important part of my recovery journey as well, you know. And after my dad passed away, I, I moved back home to Florida, where my mom lives in South Florida, Broward County, Florida. Actually, it was the epicenter of the pill mill crisis, and saw my doctor there, and he said he I needed to go see a pain uh, specialist because. He doesn't do pain medication or pain management, I guess was the term. And I ended up in the in the grip, right? Like the the just the the, the the nexus of the beginning of, you know, some of the worst times of the first wave of the overdose crisis, which was prescription opioids. And uh, I was prescribed Oxycontin and I was told, you know, it was less than one percent addictive. And my journey into a full blown addiction from there was not protracted. It was within a couple of years um, I had my first bouts with homelessness, uh, first overdoses, um, first, you know, attempts at treatment. And that progressed to heroin because I was uh, caught, got caught up in the second wave of the overdose crisis is when and I write about this in Fentanyl Nation. Right. It's when uh, states decided that the way to stop the prescription pill overdoses and um, the, the just ballooning of addiction that we were having from Appalachia to Florida, moving out into the West Coast, was to cut off the supply. And if we cut off the supply, the problem would go away. So they cut off the supply for folks who were using them, uh, didn't offer any type of meaningful treatment. And I transitioned to heroin. And um, it was a downward spiral from there. Found myself, you know, last day on the streets was actually Thanksgiving Eve 2014. Ten years ago, this very day, um, I was on the streets and I was panhandling. And I was trying to pull change together just to get food in a fix. And um, it was some of the most terrifying moments I had in my life. But Thanksgiving Eve 2014, after trying to get treatment and I wanted treatment because I I didn't necessarily want treatment, I guess you could say. I wanted a roof over my head. Mm. Right. Like I, I needed a place to sleep. Mm. I needed something to eat. And um the voice on the other end of the phone, which was a pay phone, they, they still have pay phones back then, uh, said yes and uh, checked my, myself into a public treatment facility. And kind of the rest is history, you know. Um, 
I was offered uh, the gold standard of medication for opioid use disorder, which is buprenorphine, saved my life, um, transferred to another treatment center, eventually got into recovery housing. But all of that, right, as close as I got to death, which was cl- very close, um, when I got into recovery, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to talk about recovery. I didn't want to talk about addiction. I didn't want to talk about what had gone on in my life. I didn't, I, I wanted to put all that away, it, lock and key in a box. Um, my mom, my family members never wanted to talk about it. And I just wanted to go on with my life. I was actually driving Uber in my early days of recovery. And um, that all came crashing down on me because a lot of people in that I, roommates of mine, people that I had gone to treatment with, um, just started dying left and right. Um, fe- I missed fentanyl on the West coast by a like quarter of an inch. When, when you say you up. missed it, you got clean. Had you still been using, you would have turned to fentanyl a cheaper and much more dangerous synthetic opioid. And many of your friends who you were trying to get clean or struggling with did, they didn't make it right. as a result of fentanyl. As a result of fentanyl. Yes. Um, and I would have transitioned to fentanyl because fentanyl is everything right now. Yeah, me, um, and addiction is a progressive disease as well, and that come back is to, kind of the to, natural next step to both of those points. Because I want to, geez, I, you know, I I read the headlines about fentanyl in my news segment. I've done interviews. I've known people who've used it. Uh, I've I've known people who've lost people, rich white folks, as a matter of fact, right? Because it's a pill, often, right? But let me just go back because. I'm embarrassed that I had not taught to you before. When I started researching you for this new book, I was like, how have I never taught to this guy? He's brilliant. He's done the work. Uh, but I want to just tick through your resume to show everybody how credible you are in this, because obviously you, you say you were, are an addict, activist, advocate, and now assembly. I just wanted to be illiterate. You're running for, but you've written candidate. You're candidate. Written, you're I'm running for assembly. I just needed yeah. a fourth A, Ryan. Don't stop me. The point is, you're credible. You understand all the ins and outs of this. I think most importantly, what I learned about you is you were actually selected to be on a panel that would decide what would happen with the major lawsuits and the billions of dollars won in the lawsuits mm-hmm. against Purdue and the Sackler family. Most of us know the headlines about all of these things, fentanyl, the Purdue, Sackler, opiates. We know the word. Uh, we know somebody who's been affected, but tick through a little bit of, of your resume once you got clean and, and started working on this issue as an activist and an advocate. Yeah, um, thank you. I, uh, you know, in 2016, um, after my friend Greg and after my friend Nick had passed away and I had lost a lot, but those two really were the straw for me. Um, I didn't know what to do. I knew something needed to be done. So my best friend and I packed up, uh, drove around the country in a 35 foot RV summer of 2016, eight years ago, um, just to talk to communities, talk to the stay in homes of family members who had lost their kids or their friends uh, or loved ones to overdoses. Um, Go talk to folks on the street, go talk to policymakers, go to treatment centers. We went into jails and talked to folks who were incarcerated and got back from that trip, spent 30 30 or 32 days on the road, got back from that trip and realized that there was this deep sense of something while there was all this talk in the media about this issue. And this was, remember, in 2016, this was actually quite a unifying issue, right? I mean, Hillary Clinton was calling for solutions. Donald Trump was calling for solutions, solutions, like real solutions, talking about treatment and housing and recovery. Um but the rhetoric wasn't matching up to what was going on in the ground. And so we started a nonprofit and we did it. It's a funny story. Um, $20 invested in some ads on Facebook. Uh, we'd gone to a pawn shop and got like one of those old used Google. I don't even remember what they're called. It wasn't like a laptop, but it was like Google's version of like a iPad that, you know, I think I got for like 50 bucks. Um, we didn't have internet at our recovery residence but the next door neighbors had internet that wasn't locked. So we hijacked their internet to file our paperwork and just started telling our stories on this Facebook page and asking people to submit their experiences to us. And uh, this was in like the early days of like 
advocacy, I guess you could say, using like Facebook and social media. And it, when I woke up one morning and like one of the posts had gone viral and there were like a thousand messages in the page of people, you know, connecting with us. And I was like, oh, my gosh, what what are we going to do with this? And so we turned the nonprofit into how are we going to support folks in recovery and family members um, with giving them the tools they need to help organize their communities, right? Because I see this issue. A lot of people say addiction recovery. It's not a political issue. No, my personal recovery is not a political issue, but access to what people need to stay alive, access to the healthcare supports that we need and the housing and the jobs and all that, that those are very political issues. So we really enter, we, that was kind of new frontier, right? type land for this space. And we really entered into it first. And as a result of it, started working with Congress a lot, started working with state legislatures, right? In the last several years, since we started this nonprofit, we've worked on over 400 pieces of state legislation um, that I think is very forward thinking on a bipartisan level. In 2019, you know, we were, we were some of the first ones. A lot of people see the stories about Purdue and the Sacklers, um, that didn't just happen overnight, right? Like we, our group uh, partnered with another group called Team Sharing in Massachusetts. We were the first ones to hold one of, not one of, the biggest um, protest in front of Purdue Pharma in August of 2018, right? Demanding, um, you know, that they that they uh, that they start investing in this issue, but also calling for state attorneys general. To hold them accountable. And then I was appointed by the DOJ, Trump's DOJ in 2019 to represent 120,000 victims in that case, um, negotiating the, the, the ultimate settlement, um, had to sit in court depositions and hearings with David Sackler and Richard Sackler and multiple times to provide victim statements. Some of the most evil people in the world. You know, we Narcan is now over the counter. Everybody thinks Narcan. Great. Over, and I write about this is one of the real solutions we should look at. But yeah. that didn't just happen overnight. A lot of blood was spilled to, to, uh, to you, get to that I mean, point. the way you started uh, with the stealing of the Internet connection to creating an organization and a movement of activists and leading that and being one of 500 people standing out there and protesting and bringing attention to it and getting attorneys general on board and then being appointed yourself to represent 120,000 plaintiffs. It's such an important story, and it's a story to be inspired by that you can go from where you went on the streets, living homeless, to sitting across from billionaires trying to get them to pay up, which I know still hasn't happened in terms of the, the plaintiffs. And I want to get in. I want to get into that for sure. So but but let me just let me make sure that we debunk some myths here or, or at least talk about let me just talk about addiction with you just just briefly. I've been talking about it for years. Uh, family members, friends, obviously we all have that, I think. So we all have that. But do you think, and I've read Johan Hari's book, and I've talked to health researchers and addiction experts and help family members go through treatment. Do you think there are clear cut ways to treat addiction or even identify it? Do you think that, or is it a far more nuanced uh, uh conversation, different treatments help different people um, are, are there. And when we're talking about opiates and, and, and obviously heroin and now fentanyl, is it still controversial or do you feel like there are public policies that if they were funded and resourced and not corrupted would make a huge difference on this issue? Well, it is very nuanced. Okay. I will say yes, because um, first and foremost, like when it comes to opioids, there is a gold standard. We know what works, right? We just saw a 10% decline in overdose deaths uh, recently. Um, and the reasoning behind it is the wider availability of Narcan and Naloxone, right? And the, the equally as important, though, is the expansion and availability of um, buprenorphine and methadone. Those are two medications that work. They cut uh, overdose rates, someone's chance of an overdose rate and death rate uh, nearly in half. Uh, they, they, you know, they have been widely used around the world for a long time, but these medications were very stigmatized for a long time and continue to be stigmatized here in the United States by certain treatment providers. It is unconscionable that we are in 2024 and over 40% 
of qualified treatment facilities in the United States still do not offer these medications for opioid use disorder, and they consider it a crutch. That's how it was. De- that, that's how it was described to me and my family many years while we tried to get uh, myself uh, on those medications. Now, that being said, we know that that works, and that is that is the direction I think that Congress is headed in. And there's there's quite bipartisan unity around that, but there's still barriers. You think about um, methadone, right? Methadone right now, you, you your primary care provider uh, can't prescribe it. Uh, the only way to get methadone is go is going to a qualified out, outpatient treatment provider, also called an OTP. Um, that's only sometimes open between the hours of like 5 a.m. and 10 a.m. and waiting in line to get dosed. And typically, you know, um, the, the, the OTPs um, are placed in communities, right, um, serving certain populations. And, you know, I'm in Nevada. You go up into the rurals. Right. And there's no OTP for, right. you know, 100, 200 right. miles. But the other the nuance that's important about this is you bring up different recovery pathways. Right. We do not have a buprenorphine or a suboxone uh, or a methadone for stimulant use disorder, right? For methamphetamine, right? For any type of cocaine, any types of stimulants. The NIDA budget nationally, and I, and I write about this a lot in Fentanyl Nation, um, the NIDA budget is just a few billion dollars, right? It's not much. I think it's like $3 billion or something like that a year, Um we need to be looking at this with over 100,000 deaths, right, that we have annually. Um, even with the decline, we're over 100,000. You know, we need to be marshalling all resources we have available. There were two public health crises, you know, um, in, in the last decade here in the United States, right? One being COVID, which I think we dealt with as a real public health crisis. The other one being um, overdose. Overdose. Well, one of them is your fault and one of them is not. Correct. That's absolutely correct. That's, why, and that, that's how we treat things. Yes. I think that's how society yes. and, and even government often too often sees things. Yep. You chose to do drugs and you didn't choose to get COVID, although even within COVID, a lot of people blamed it on uh, on others. But regardless, I think that's the, the most binary. Right, way. But even but even but even if you look at like that choice decision. Right. So we know that addiction, substance use disorder, for the most part, right, for the most part, there are environmental factors that come into play for some people. But it is a brain disease. Right. This is a brain disease. It is it is qualified in the DSM as a brain disease. Um, I actually, and, by the way, are, just to be clear, there are some of us and I think that the right way to look at it is it shouldn't matter. None of these things. I don't believe that much in choice. Your choice leads to consequences. You know, I mean, there's we just put together. We put the guy uh, to to death. Cat. We just killed a guy. I don't I don't Mm -hmm. believe in that. I don't know if he even committed the crime. But whether or not you chose to do drugs, whether or not it's an addiction or not, I don't think we need to have that argument to look at what's killing people and treat it. Mm -hmm. Same thing with guns or or anything else. So I'm not sure the whole, oh, you chose that. That's why there's a lot there's a lot of parallels to this around HIV AIDS, right? Like another thing you chose, you know, you chose to have sex. Now you didn't. Everybody chooses it. Sorry. Right. (laughs) And you think about drugs, but you think about drugs for a second, right? There are I mean, what we forget about is that there is a drugs have been as American as apple pie yeah. since the beginning of time, right? People use drugs in this country. Um, and, and what we need to be doing is also looking at some of the reasoning, some of the underlying factors that lead people to use drugs. But there's a lot of people who recreation. Look, I live in Las Vegas who recreationally use drugs, who come down here, who party. They are not people with substance use disorders. They are not people who end up becoming with like chaotic drug use down the road. But some folks who are dealing with a lot of those underlying factors and tra- unresolved traumas that have happened, you know, do become addicts or do become, you know, dependent on these yeah. drugs to deal with those underlying factors. Those are the ones that we discard and say don't don't matter and that we shouldn't be helping. And quite frankly, you know, what terrifies me is now in this toxic political environment that we live in. The, the race by both Democrats and Republicans is to look tough on drugs, but looking tough on drugs most of the time translates to looking tough on the people who are suffering from addiction. Therefore, we are putting them at a higher risk of becoming um, uh, 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 of dying first, um, but of also the recidivism 
back into a failed criminal right, justice right. system when it comes into this, when it comes specific to this issue. So much that I uh, haven't even gotten to. I only have a few more minutes. Um, you've got to read the book. It's one of these that I'm reading it and preparing uh, to talk to the author, Ryan, in this case, obviously. I'm like, well, I'm not going to get to much of it because it's just so much. So let me let I, I thought it would be really important to just debunk some myths. We'll talk to you. I'll have you back whenever you want. I know you said you join our one of our hangouts uh, and talk about your your campaign there in Nevada. But just tell me about fentanyl. I think most of us don't understand it. Obviously, it's very politicized in terms of how it gets here from China through Mexico. My understanding is most of it is in pills and it comes through ports of entry like airports. Mm-hmm. It's easy, compact. It's not like these other drugs, obviously, which you need to grow in the ground and, and, and all of those things. Well, debunk some things. Tell us about fentanyl. Uh, and what some of the things, the myths also, you, you open the book debunking something about that people are just dying, being close to it or even touching it. So some myth, myth breaking, if you wouldn't mind, take the time you want. Yeah. So just a, a couple of things. Right. So I, I describe it. And so is the United Nations as a very good medicine and a very bad drug. Right. Fentanyl has been a staple of Western medicine for, you know, since the 1950s. It was synth- synthesized by Dr. Paul Jansen. Um, it's used every single day safely in medical and hospital settings. Um, it has been a lifesaver for some. So there is a very big difference between medical fentanyl and then the fentanyl you hear about on the news, which is uh, the, the synthetic illicit fentanyl. You are correct. Um, we are now in the era of synthetics to uh, manufacture uh, illicit fentanyl. Folks here in the United States, and it has happened here in the United States, and it also, you know, I'll get there. I have, there's so many myths to debunk. I'll get there in a second. But you can buy the precursors for it online, right? Typically, it is coming from China right now. But even if we were to completely shut down that pipeline in China, um, f- the precursors will move over to India. We've already started to see that happen. So it's this game of whack-a-mole. People get the precursors for it, the analogs. And with, you know, a chemist who has, you know, half a brain could essentially, you know, uh, uh, create enough fentanyl uh, to be catastrophic for a community within their bathtub, you know, and, and we call it the bathtub gin of opioids. Now, most of this fentanyl, the majority of it is being uh, manufactured um, down south, right, by the Sinaloa cartel, but it is being transported here to the United States. And this is one of the big myths that's out there um, through legal ports of entry, over 80 percent of it through legal ports of entry by United States citizens for United States citizens through these, you know, in these cargo vans. We are not going to be, you know, completely disrupting trade between the United States and Mexico. Um, We have to keep the trade open, which is why, you know, the bipartisan border security bill that was killed um, made a lot of sense to a lot of us because it invested in technology right. that would be able to, 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 and the sensors to be able to find it in these cargo ships. Now, that being said, it's also being manufactured in Canada in large quantities. One of the largest busts that we had of an illicit, uh, it was, it, I believe it was last March, illicit uh, uh, fentanyl chemistry labs was in Vancouver. Wow. It's also being manufactured in Arizona. There was a huge DE bus, DEA bus down there. But again, we're playing whack-a-mole because we're in the era of synthetics right now. You don't need, you know, these large harvesting seasons and lots of water and armies, you know, uh, to protect crops. Those days are over. Just to, right? just to now, be clear, I'm a little confused. There's a fentanyl that's been used forever and it's safe when used by doctors. And then there's synthetic fentanyl. They are not the same. All fentanyl is not the same. That word uh, may confuse us, right? There's there's illicit fentanyl, right? It's all synthetic. There's illicit fentanyl, and then there's medical grade fentanyl. Okay. I will tell you one of the most harmful, and I write about in the book, and and honestly, sad stories that you will hear is how stigmatized and how much this misinformation has impacted pain patients who rely on this medication um, to 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 literally stay alive and have a quality of life, and yeah. the a tremendous spike in suicides that has happened in the pain community because people are abruptly cut off because of all this misinformation that is out there about fentanyl. Now, on to some of the more fantastical stories. You hear, you know, all the time about these mass overdose events happening, and you'll hear the news saying suspected fentanyl, you know, overdose in a, in a certain population. 
And then the news will never follow up to, to, to let you know that it actually wasn't some sort of like mass casualty event because people were exposed to fentanyl. You cannot overdose from fentanyl by being in its presence. You, it is physiologically impossible to overdose from what fentanyl about that little by boy? just well, touching that little boy, it. That little boy, I think, in New York City crawled across the ground and uh, touched some fentanyl and died. And I was on TV with a, a woman who was now terrified to send her kid to childcare as a result of that. And I insensitively told her, A, I don't think that happened. B, if it happened, it was a freak accident. And C, uh, if you, I said, you're a bad mom. <laughs> no, well, listen, nice. like, like, like the likelihood, what likely happened there, because there are stories out there that are incredibly heartbreaking like that, that, that impact kids is that the child probably ingested it somehow. There was probably some sort of an ingesting. You can't, you can't by just touching it. It is not absorbed. You can't put the anything skin, in their right? mouth. If you take one of those pills, that's it. But I'll tell you one of the, the really sad and awful outcomes that I've seen as a result of these stories. You know, John Oliver did a great episode on this a couple of months ago, too, where he debunked a lot of these myths. Yes, I'm familiar um, with his work. Go ahead. Is, is that people are afraid to administer Narcan or rescue breathing to folks who are overdosing because they have consumed th this media um, that they're going to overdose and die as well. And that's just not true. Wow. You've got, I write it, I write about it in the book. There's, uh, in Arkansas, there was a story last year of, um, you know, local authorities putting out an advisory for everybody to wipe down their, uh, shopping carts because they may have fentanyl residue on them and it may kill them if they don't wipe down their shopping carts. Like, this is um, fentanyl is scary enough, yeah. I will tell you, um, <laughs> than than to have to layer on this misinformation, because what it does is then it people don't understand. There's a direct correlation between these stories that have been debunked left and right and are not backed by any type of empirical data or science behind them. They lead to bad policy. Right. Because then you get policymakers who get whipped up in a frenzy and start deciding that they're going to the way they're going to approach this is by um, overweighting, you know, the the supply reduction right. and completely ignoring the demand reduction. Right. And I argue that it has to be a balance between the two. Law enforcement has an important role to play. Supply reduction is definitely a part of it. But we have to have parity with demand reduction, too, which means treatment, housing, peer recovery support services, ending homelessness, which, which, by the way, cities like Houston, Texas have done that by implementing a housing first policy and have reduced their homelessness by nearly 60 percent in the last seven years. Like this is something but we all that do. does is now give an addict a home to do their drugs. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, like, I don't even know how to reply to sometimes when folks bring that to me, because what we have seen and what the data shows is that if you put a roof over somebody's head, the likelihood of them actually engaging with wraparound services is way higher. We're saving a lot more lives. But most importantly, for the conservatives, and I am a conservative at heart when it comes to economics, I will tell you, it saves our communities a tremendous amount of money for every dollar that we invest in services like the ones I've just been talking about, there is a $7 return on your community. You go to Wall Street and you talk to any venture capitalist and, and talk about that type of return, they're going to be all in. But then again, it comes down, you know, you, you, you say the word stigma, right? It's not just stigma. Stigma is just a really kind word for what is prejudice, bias, discrimination against certain populations of people. We have to get real and we have to have real people. And it's also, but right? isn't it? But it's also just like, you know, when you say conservative, you're conservative. I don't even buy I don't think conservatives are fiscally conservative. I think they just want to take the same government money and use it for their own private thing reasons. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, even if the, even if I did buy the, you know, the traditional consistent definition of conservatism, fiscal conservatism, which is what you're referring to, which in this case is government gaining a bang for its buck. The other mm -hmm. side of conservatism, um, conservative minded people, and I don't think this is offensive or wrong, is they love punitive measures. They like to punish people. And so they I, 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 I say they like to folks like to punish people, but they like to punish a certain type of person, because this is where I get whipped up in a frenzy is somebody who sat across the table in the middle of covid, by the way, from the Sackler family who is yet to be indicted yet to have any criminal charges by any states or the federal government against them who get to write a something like a th we don't know what it's going to be because they're still negotiating the deal but somewhere between a probably three to five billion dollar check still have you know another 
you know, 10 to $15 billion in their bank account of, of the money that we know because we can't trace the money that's around the world, you know, and walk away squat, scot free. Corporate billionaires get off scot free every single day, right? But the people that we're punitive towards are the ones who actually need help. These are not drug lords. These are not drug dealers. Right. You know, these are people who are suffering from a public health condition. And the best way that we can come up with to, to support them is to make jails treatment centers if the jails decide they actually want to offer treatment and most of them don't yeah well i mean but it's the 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 point is they want to target people it's easy to say black and brown people when it comes to opiates and fentanyl obviously we have a lot to talk about with it being more uh, affecting white communities but generally speaking it's poor people and even more importantly even if it's wealthy people privileged people it's easy to punish someone who made a bad choice you made a bad choice so I'm going to punish right. you. But that doesn't that might feel emotionally well. A, it's not a deterrent. And B, it's not it's not sound. It does nothing. It only as you just talked about it. Chris well, Moore. and this is interesting because I write about the choice piece too. like the overdose in most cases. Right. So you've got this new phenomenon going on around the country. which has been kind of bipartisan in some states. Right. But called um, drug induced homicide. Right. And where overdose is now being investigated as murder. And in some respects, those laws, the intent of those laws makes sense when it is, you know, El Chapo. Right. Let's let's take him, for example. But the way that the law is being interpreted by certain prosecutors is, let's say me and my best friend. Right. We're using back in the days I went. I got a certain amount of drugs, a couple bags you know, from my drug dealer back in the day. Right. And my best friend and I got high together. Um, I ended up waking up from a near overdose. He ended up dying. They're going to charge me with his murder. Right. And that is insane to me. Right. Because that's not murder. It was a very bad and devastating choice, you know, um, that happened, but it was not premeditated murder. Right. And that is how it's being charged. Um, So these are some of the bad policy decisions that are coming as a result of this frenzy and misinformation that's out there. And I will say Republicans and Democrats for a long time were tripping over themselves to say we can't arrest our way out of a public health crisis. They were saying that when it was Oxycontin and heroin uh, impacting mostly You know, well, not mostly, but impacting in the media, mostly white communities in Appalachia, Kentucky, moving down to Florida. Then we moved over to fentanyl and the southern border came into play and all these different narratives and myths started going around. And then we started to see how, you know, fentanyl overdoses are disproportionately impacting communities of color and black communities. And now all of a sudden it's let's go back to arresting our way out of it. And you know what? We've been here before. We have been here before. We were here with crack cocaine in the 80s and 90s. And we saw what how how how, how that turned out. Like the playbook, that's why I say, it, you know, part of the subtitle is the failed war, toxic politics and the failed war on drugs is because the playbook that we are using right now for fentanyl is literally the exact same playbook yeah, no, we used I mean, with it's, crack. It's, it's, it's weird to say this to you, but I think I was talking with experts when you were still doing drugs uh, about the failed drug war and this playbook that you've so uh, been a part of identifying and, and trying to fix. You have another interview. The book is just out. Yes. This is th- I, I did not do it, ladies and gentlemen. I failed you. So Ryan has to come back to do part two. And then I'll probably just put these two together. I mean, I'll obviously put this one out right away. Uh, for the book and people can read, but I'd love to have you join uh, our hangout and I'd love to do a part two and talk more about your campaign. Um, if even before election day, uh, we can do all that. That would be great. And, but I know you got to go. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining me and more importantly for the work that you've done on behalf of so many victims. And I know how frustrating it must be. I don't know. I can't imagine because I I know just a a little bit of what you've dealt with fighting with Purdue and the Sackler family, but your books are so important and uh, do a, a lot to enlighten us. Thank you so much. Pete, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, there you go. Ryan Hampton, go get the book and go support his run at the Nevada Assembly. I don't, don't you think he would be a great, great guy to have working in your state government? I have invited him to our hangout next week, I believe, and you can check out his website, Ryan Hampton. 
dot org and Ryan for Nevada dot com is his Nevada State Assembly campaign website. Great guy, important story, pretty much one of the most important stories we can the issues we can be talking about here, and I'll keep talking about it. Near and dear to my heart, and I'm sure many of yours. Okay, that's it. That's all I've got for you. Sorry for a little uh, bit of a downer. I know I didn't have a lot of uh, comedy or humor in today's episode. Always conscious of that, but really appreciate you listening and supporting the podcast. Rate it, rating and review, and sign up for a paid subscription if you haven't already. You bumblebees listening all the way to the end. You are the best. JohnCarroll.org is where you get the music by this guy, the great John Carroll. Take it away, brother. On your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to the end of your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down, boy, you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was going to come before the change would begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go to make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up You got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up stand oh, up you got to stand up oh, come on just stand up everybody got to stand up in the darkest hour stand up people got the power stand up come on come on come on come on come on